Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Film Nerd Podcast. This is episode 10. I'm Vince, uh, and I have a repeat guest on with me tonight, welcoming, welcoming back Chris Castellani from episode four. Uh, just a little condensed intro, podcaster, social media sports guy, Tigers fan, U of M fan, movie fan, reviewer, Chris Castellani. Welcome back. How you doing? Happy to be here, man. Yeah, looking forward to it. I, I guess I, I've, I've become a man who wears many hats, and I've, I'm going to have to wear all of them uh, this week with uh, Tiger Spring training and got movies to review and, of course, March Madness going on. So plenty to talk about for sure. You got there's a lot of pretty much everything I just hit there you got going on right now. And speaking of yeah. March Madness, we're not going to we won't go too long here because we got We got some a little bit of a break in between games here, but we got to get, get back to some good games uh, in a little bit. Um, so Chris and I are going to talk about two things here tonight. The first thing I wanted to chat with him about, uh, the Oscars this past, I believe it was Monday morning. They announced the, uh, 21, 2021 Oscar nominations. Um, and we're going to kind of go through each major category here and talk about, uh, kind of some snubs surprises. Um, and then maybe what our picks would be for each one of the major categories here. Um, so obviously the first thing with the Oscars this year is for the first time, I think since world war two, they extended it. Um, yeah. the dead, the deadline usually I think is before Christmas, they extended it through the end of February. And I think I remember reading that the only other time they did that was world war two. So it's been a long time since they did that. Um, and obvious for obvious reasons, you know, with the, the many releases pushed. So there's a few films on, on, under these, um, you know, each category that's that are nominations for films that came out in January, February. Um, Chris has uh, put out, I'll, you know, link his YouTube channel. So if you want to check out his 2020 best of list, um, I know that uh, some of these films you had on there, I'm still working through. I'm pretty uh, into getting all the documentaries, uh, foreign films and independent films. So I'm, I'm pretty tedious. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm holding off, but at a few films that you put on your list, I'm actually going to push to my 2021. Um, anything that came out in January and February, I'm not going to, I'm going to put on my 2021 list. So few of these films I have not seen and I, I last time I talked to you I I think since since last time we talked you've seen a few more of these but mm -hmm. there's still a couple um like we're going to get into the very first one here with the best picture nomination that I can't even find a showing of it in local theaters around us so we'll get we'll just go ahead and get started with it uh best picture nominees actually you know what no let's end with that <laughs> let's end with best picture let's work our way backwards a little bit here so let's start with some of the broader ones uh best cinematography we're not going to go through every single one i just kind of want to go through some of the major ones um so let's kind of go best cinematography here we got judas and the black messiah mank news of the world no man let no mad land and the trial of the chicago seven um what do you think on that when he surprises or snubs on that list there for best cinematography no real surprises but i think Almost all of the technical awards are going to, it's going to be a boxing match between Mank and Nomadland. Um, I, I was, yeah. I like, I like Nomadland a lot. I didn't love it, but I adored the technical elements of it. And I think Absolutely, yeah. this is, this is probably going to be the favorite in, in a lot of years. I think it would probably be Mank. That movie looks beautiful, but I, I think Nomadland is probably going to be the favorite in a lot of technical categories. The only, and this is going to become a reoccurring theme for me, the, old, the couple of films that I'm really disappointed didn't get any love, two Netflix original films, uh, um, The Devil All the Time and um, I'm Thinking of Ending Things. Both of those had great, great cinematography in terms of the colors, framing, blocking, camera work. And so I was kind of disappointed to see those films got nothing, performance, no, no acting nominations, anything. Um, for me though, I was kind of surprised about, um, I guess, The Trial of Chicago 7. I don't know. I, I watched that one back in the fall. I wasn't big on it. It didn't stick in my mind. Um, but I guess, it, I guess I shouldn't be surprised. I feel like that was kind of going to happen uh, because that was kind of a popular one. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think? What do you got? What's your pick I, for this one? I, I'm, go I'm going with Nomadland. And I do agree with you. And I like Trial of the Chicago 7 a lot. But when I think of cinematography, that's not in even in my top five of things I liked about that movie. Yeah. So yeah, I, I would I think Nomad Land. I think that it's gonna be this is gonna be a year where almost it's gonna sweep a lot of the technical categories. And I guess before we even get a little bit further here, Nomad Land is among a few films here that I feel like in a normal year would not get any recognition at the Academy Awards, which I think is really cool. 
um, with the Academy Awards this year. And I'll kind of touch on a few more of those as we go through here. But there's a handful of films that because so many there were so few releases, um, I was pleasantly surprised that they got nominated. But also it's like there's not much else. And so yeah. there wasn't there wasn't much else for people to nominate. Um, so we'll move on here to the next two. Both of them are screenplay. We got best original screenplay, best adapted. So we'll go best adapted first. Uh, Borat, Borat, subsequent movie film. Uh, the Father, Nomadland, One Night in Miami, and The White Tiger. Any uh, snubs or surprises on best adapted screenplay? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think. Nothing that pops comes to mind right away. I, what's weird, though, looking at this, None of these, and I didn't see the father. I'm surprised White Tiger was not. That was the one I meant was referring to earlier. The father has no uh, streaming release and has yeah. yet to have, at least where we are in Lansing, Mid Michigan, I have not found a local theatrical release. So I don't know when I'm going to be able to see that one. It wouldn't shock me if, because I, I feel like very often, not always, but very often, best adapted screenplay goes to the movie that is nominated for a bunch of awards, but doesn't win anything else. Like Joe, Joe rabbit won it. <laughs> that's, you know what I mean? That's like a very, uh, yeah, that's a very true observation. I like agree. It, it, in yeah. all those years where Tarantino didn't win director, he almost always won screenplay screenplay. Yeah. I think we might have a case like that. And I think they might either throw a bone to either the father or one night in Miami, because one night in Miami, I don't believe got a best picture or a best director nomination. So they might be, uh, they might be inclined to kind of give it to that. I think it'll be between those two. Yep. Did not get, yep. You're right. Did not get either. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I tend to agree with you with that observation. It is, it is interesting how, if you don't have a year where a film kind of sweeps some of these major categories, they tend to award, like you said, one of the two screenplay nominees uh, ends up going to a film that doesn't get anything else. So I do think that's kind of interesting. Um I was, again, I'm surprised. I'm thinking of ending things. Adapted screenplay from a novel, Devil All the Time, also a novel. Um, I think they were done very well in, in film version, how they were, you know, um, seemingly adapted. I read some of the changes of both the novels. So to me, those are some disappointing snubs. Um, I have not had a chance yet to see The White Tiger. That one's on Netflix. One Night in Miami, I still have on my watch list. And like you, the father, I've not been able to see. Um, I... I would be, I would think it'd be weird if they gave it to Borat again. Yeah. To me, it's going to be Nomad Land, The Father, or One Night in Miami. I haven't heard a lot about The White Tiger. I've read a few reviews, but not sure on that one. Um, best original screenplay we got Judas and the Black Messiah, Minari, Promising Young Woman, Sound of Metal, and The Trial of the Chicago Seven. I mean, I Promising Young Woman is my favorite movie of last year, but I, I love, I have I love hard, it too. Yeah, I have a hard time believing that. Um, they're not going to give throw another bone to Sorkin here. I, I think I, um, yeah. Chicago Seven will probably win here. And, and again, you know where I said that cinematography was not something that I thought of when I, I thought of the reasons why I like that movie. His screenplay is is leaps off the page in my opinion. Yep. And I know he's won it before, which sometimes is detriment when you look at kind of the you know the the political aspect of of a lot of this stuff, but. Nothing else really pops out. Maybe, maybe Judas and the Black Messiah, but I think that's going to yeah. win some other categories. So I think that here they're gonna they're gonna hand one to Trial of Chicago Seven. I agree with you. Um, and I I don't see any snubs to me off the top of my head sticking out. Um, in terms of an original screenplay, Tenet I think is a little too bloated for most, too bombastic. Yeah. Um, to get an original uh screenplay. Um. So, I, I mean, off the top of my head, I, and I'm looking at my list, I couldn't, you know, there was nothing really that sticks out that should be on there. And, and I will I would, say, if, the, if there was a snub for cinematography, I might have I might have put Tenet in there. As, yeah. As, in cinematography. I mean, Nolan's yep. movies just look so beautiful. So, I, I if I'm not surprised it wasn't nominated. It did get visual effects. It was. Yeah. We which, which I kind of yeah. skipped over some of the other te technical categories just to kind of keep things moving along. But, yeah, that I would have been shocked if they didn't nominate it for visual effects. Right. Um, for best original, I, I would love to see, I, I know you're a big Aaron Sorkin guy. I like Aaron Sorkin, but I would kind of love to see the three middle nominees here that I mentioned, Minari, Promising Young Woman, Sound of Metal, very all small films. Um, I would love to see any one of them get, get it. Um, I wouldn't be upset er, per se if the trial of the Chicago seven got it. Um, I would be a little annoyed because it is based on true events. I always think that's kind of a cheap out when they nominate a film like Judas and the Black Messiah 
it's based on true events, true yeah. real life people, historical events, even though it's, you know, it's not adapted from something, it's kind of adapted from real life. So yeah. the other three, since they're original stories, truly, you know, not based on anything at all, I would love to see them, especially, so, I mean, I love Sound of Metal and Promise to Young Woman. Me too. Those two, I would really enjoy seeing those. So let's jump into the uh, acting categories here before we get into best picture and best director. So let's go through um, supporting first. We got best supporting actor, Sacha Baron Cohen. Uh, for Trial of Chicago 7, I feel like he could have, you know, also maybe got best actor for Borat, but yeah. they snubbed him the first time around. I don't, I think he won the Golden Globe. He was not nominated for an Oscar the first time around for the original Borat. Daniel Kaluuya, uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. Leslie Odom Jr. from One Night in Ma Miami. Paul Racy. That was such a surprise, and I was happy yeah. to see it for Sound of Metal. And then Lakeith Stanfield. It's this is an, for Judas and the Black Messiah. Now, this is a weird topic of discussion I've seen on social media. It's very confusing. Daniel Kaluuya and Lakeith Stanfield were both nominated for Best Supporting Actor in Judas and the Black Messiah. And so what I read is apparently what happens in a situation like this is it's all based on the voters and what they assume they would fall oh, under. Okay. And they said what probably happened is be, even though Lakeith Stanfield is technically the lead, he's the he should have been nominated for best actor right. but they said what happened is he probably got more votes for people saying oh best supporting actor than he did for best actor so that's how they categorize it which to me is very bizarre yeah same i didn't know yeah, it worked I, that way that is very odd i this is a very strong category i mean Super really strong, strong. i, I mean strong. i think that um you know in a lot of years i think they would give it to someone like sasha baron cohen i i just i the academy loves that classically comic actor stretches gets kind of the role of a lifetime but um i i as you said i'm really happy paul racy was nominated he was to oh, me, yeah absolutely it's weird because i like sound of metal a lot but i'm not crazy about the girlfriend i mean i, I call it a subplot but it's kind of the main plot yeah, was it to me, my, my, the parts is that olivia that, cook olivia yeah cook, who, who's really good who's yeah. really good in it i just i the movie to me was gold when it was those two, when it was Paul Racy. Some, those are some of the best moments in the film are when yeah, they're it, talking or communicating to each other. You know, they're yeah. very emotional, my, powerful. My favorite moment of the movie and real, one of my favorite scenes of, of the year was their final kind of interaction together. Wow, I thought it was yeah. so heartbreaking. Um, with that said, I'm not crazy about Judas and the Black Messiah, but I thought Daniel Kaluuya was sensational. And I Did would you, be- have, I, you, have you had uh, any chance to listen to how Fred Hampton spoke in real life? Yes. Well, I mean, he they, they nails the accent. They showed it at the end of the movie. Then I went back and watched some stuff yes. afterwards. Yeah, no, he is. Um, He's a revelation in that. And he's a great actor and he's been a great actor for a while. I think I think they're going to toss it to him. Loved Leslie Odom Jr. in One Night in Miami. And yeah, I think if not see that one yet, if not for Daniel Kaluuya really breaking out here, I think he might be the favorite. But yeah, I, I think um, Kaluuya, will, I think when there is the possibility that the votes between Kalua and Stanfield kind of cancel each other out and it ends up going to that, you know, kind of the third option, but I don't think that's going to happen. I think Daniel Kalua went best supporting the own for me, a snub here would be Daniel, um, not Daniel, David Thewlis in um, I'm thinking of ending things. He is so good in that uh, for a supporting role. And then you could have nominated like two or three people in the, the devil all the time. Yeah. Uh, Robert Pattinson is great in that Harry Mel, uh, Harry Melling, I think is his name is great. Yeah. Um, I I'm kind of right there with you um, in terms of who I would, I would love to see Paul Racy. Um, I wouldn't be upset. I personally wouldn't be upset if anyone won any, any of these people won any of these guys won this category, but Paul Racy would be my pick there. Um, best supporting actress before we go to the lead roles here, huge surprise, pleasant surprise for the first yeah. one here, Maria Bakalova for Borat. Um, she honestly, I loved that Sacha Baron Cohen brought her on, uh, yeah. but she was great. Then you got Glenn Close, Hill, Hillbilly Elegy. I'll get into that one in a second. Olivia, yeah. Col Olivia Coleman, the father, uh, Amanda Seyfried, Mank, and then I hope I don't mispronounce it, Yoon Ya Jung from Minari. Um, what do you got? What do you think? I, I was happy Marie Bakalova was nominated mm -hmm. too. I, that was such a standout performance in that movie. As great as Sacha yeah. Baron Cohen is, she was so funny in that movie. I mean, it's Borat. If you've seen Bruno, you know that Sacha Baron Cohen's characters do have a tendency to become very grating if you, you know, don't if you don't have some sort of restraint on them. I think she added a weight to that movie that really kind of anchored it yes. down in a, in a good way. 
Um, surprising I, way, in a surprising way. I did very, not expect very, that yeah. when um, I went into that movie. It was strange that that film ended up having, a, you know, a semblance of heart because I think that sometimes I, I love so I, shocking. I, I love his comedy, but I think in, at times sometimes his comedy has come across as a bit mean spirited. It's never bothered me, but I here's what I think. I believe that, and I have not seen The Father. Like I said, I got to yep, say this. Neither have I. My guess is the best performance in this category is Olivia Coleman. But, and it's I, yeah. ironic, two years ago, Olivia Coleman upset Glenn Close to win. For the favorite. She was the great in that. Favorite. She was excellent in that. Yeah, and that's a very good movie. I don't think Hillbilly Elegy, I haven't seen Hillbilly Elegy. Dude, the, it's the, bad. It's bad. The parts of it that I watched <laughs> looked bad. Um, it is. It She's good. Poor, right, well, that's the thing. It got poor reviews. She's been nominated, I believe, eight times now. I, I just I I think they're they're dying to give it to her and I think they will. I just think it would be so funny if this is the role she finally wins it for. And people were speculating that Amy Adams might get nominated for that movie. She didn't. Um, but they were like, is she gonna finally Amy Adams is also another, you know, actress who's been nominated so many times and hasn't won and she's so so great in everything she does. So the iron it's just it's gonna be such a big meme and joke in the film Twitter community if she ends up yeah. winning for this role. Um yeah. I wouldn't mind Yoon Ya Jung from Minari because she was so good in Minari. That uh, all the performances in that movie were great, so I wouldn't be upset with that. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be upset with anything here. Um, the only thing I would say is uh, another snub. I'm thinking of ending things. Uh, Tony Collette. <laughs> She's uh, always good, man. She, she is. She, she never me, gets honored for anything. I'm she, always to shocked me is by that. Maybe the most one of the most underrated actresses. I've she never is. seen her give a bad performance. No, and I mean another. You know, the, the Academy never recognizes horror, but she Heredity. was incredible mm-hmm. in Hereditary. Incredible. Or Hereditary. That's yeah. So good. Anyway, yeah. um, let's move on to the the leads here uh, to keep things pushing along. So we got best actor and best actress. Best actor. I can't believe how stacked this category yeah. is. I'm very excited to see who wins. I wouldn't be mad at any of these. We have Riz Ahmed, Sound of Metal, Chadwick Boseman for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Anthony Hopkins for The Father, Gary Oldman for Mank, and Steven Yoon. Uh, is it Yoon or Yun? Yoon? I, I think, think it's Yoon, Yoon from Yoon. Minari. Michigan um, native. Yeah, that's right. He is from Michigan. Yeah, and I, Detroit, you know, yeah. most people are are familiar with him from Walking Dead. Um, but since The Walking Dead, man, he has branched down to a lot of great movies. Um, if you haven't seen the Korean film Burning, uh, he plays a sinister character in that film, and it's one of his best performances. And then I would say this in Minari. If you haven't seen Minari, he is incredible in this movie. Um, what are your thoughts on the lead actor role here? Or Chadwick, Bo- Chadwick Boseman will win. Um, I would I would be, be shocked if he if he lost. Yeah. This to me is like if I was I'm not a gambling man, but if I was to put money on one, I would say him. And he's great in my reign. He's my easily my I'm not crazy about that movie, but he's easily the best part of it. I think well, years from now, when Riz Ahmed gets nominated for another Oscar, he's so talented. Yeah, when he gets nominated for another one, and maybe he's <laughs> like neck and neck with somebody else, we're gonna say, you know what, we're gonna give it to him now. Cause he probably should have won it for sound of metal. It's one of those instances where yeah. it's lined up with, you know, a, a, a great performance and a sentimental story. It's a tragic story. Obviously, but I, mean, yeah. I thought, I thought Riz Ahmed in sound of metal was an absolute reference. Sure. I thought he was, yeah. was one, of, one of my favorite performances of the last several years. For sure. If, if there is an upset pick here though, I wouldn't say him. I would say Anthony Hopkins. He's another one though where he's won before. If he yes. hadn't, if he hadn't, this would be a much more interesting category because you could have the kind of Christopher Plummer kind of uh, situation for beginners where he was yep. like 87 or something and ended up winning an Oscar, you know, late in his life. But he's already he got his one for Silence of the Lambs. He's, everyone knows he's already one of the greatest actors of all time. I think he was nominated last year for the two popes. So uh, yes, I believe it, it'll be it'll be Chadwick and uh, it'll be it'll be a wonderful moment, a sad moment. But uh, and, and well deserved. I think he's great in that movie. Absolutely, um, I'm right. I pretty much everything you just said. I agree with you. Um, I the only thing I would say in terms of a snub on this list, <laughs> I'm going to keep going back to it, man. Jesse Plemons. I'm thinking of ending things. I thought he was in one of the all of the leads in that. All the performances in that are great. Mm-hmm. Um, and that that would probably be it. The only one off the top of my head I would think for a snub. Um, 
and I'm not really surprised in any of these. Uh, I think it's a strong category. It's going to be interesting to see who wins, and I'm right there with you in terms of how that plays out. Yeah. All right, we're down to our last three. Best actress. We got Viola Davis. Viola Davis, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Andra Day, The United States versus Billie Holiday. Vanessa Kirby for Pieces of a Woman. Frances McDormand for Nomadland. And Carrie Mulligan, Promising Young Woman. Thoughts? Well, out of nowhere, Andra Day is might be one of the favorites because she won the golden globe kind of so very yeah, surprisingly and I, have you seen this film yet no i dude, I, i'll be real with you i barely heard of it so, i so. hadn't heard of it till it got nominated for all this right. stuff and i just restarted a hulu account and it's on hulu so i was thinking about trying to watch it pretty soon here so yeah i haven't had a chance to check it out i have not had pieces of a woman is on netflix I haven't had a chance to watch that one either unfortunately but yeah i um i mean you know my, my personal pick here is carrie mulligan i, I thought when you have a movie where essentially the entire film, it works on a pass fail system based solely on her performance and she knocks it out of the park. I think it's, it's one of those movies where she should win for this. I think it's, it's not necessarily an Academy type movie. It is very bleak. It's very dour. It's very pessimistic, which is all the reasons why I loved it. Uh, now in, it, in the, in the inverse of that is that you had Joker last year, which Joaquin won for and deservedly so, but that was also an instance where you had an a actor who'd been nominated several times and, and yep. maybe served it in the past. And yep. uh, not to say Carrie Mulligan isn't deserving here. I think she is, but I, you know, I'm actually going to go with the upset pick here. I think Andrew day, cause I, I would lean towards Francis McDormand. She seems to be the general favorite, but Again, she's I, won before someone who's won she's, before she's well, been she's nominated won, and won, she's won yeah. twice. So, yeah. I mean, I think that if, if there's the opportunity to kind of sneak one by the Academy, it could be Andrew day for the United States versus Billy holiday. Yeah. I don't have a ton of thoughts on this category. I'm kind of right there with you. I could see it going a couple different ways, but I think that's the logical pick. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Viola Davis won uh, because she has become a pretty popular nominee. Has she won? She's won. She won yeah, she for won the help. For, she won for fences. Fences. That was right. Yeah. Um, so I know that, you know, she's kind of a popular name as well. So I wouldn't be surprised if she won. I have a snub that I'm not surprised didn't make it. Uh, there's a independent film from a first time filmmaker on Netflix that I highly recommend everyone check out if you haven't seen it. It's one of my favorites of 2020. It's called The 40-Year-Old Virgin. Play on, on the title 40-Year-Old Virgin. Um, directed, written, produced, starring about the life of Rada Blank. Um, so basically, it's a, it's a filmed version of real-life events that happened to her, and she plays herself. Uh, she's a woman who's about to turn 40 years old. She's a failing playwright, used to be big in her 20s and 30s kind of doesn't make anymore and she tries to become a rapper it takes place mm -hmm. in new york city uh she is incredible in it uh i'm not surprised she didn't get a nomination because sometimes those smaller films don't tend to but that would have been the only one that i would have loved to have seen uh get a nomination all right last two categories here and then we're going to jump into talking about cherry for a bit before before we uh send chris on his way and we got to get back to march madness oh yeah a uh, best director we have lee isaac chung for minari emerald Fennell for promising young woman David Fincher for Mank, Thomas Vinterberg for another round, which wow. I was very happy, pleasantly surprised to see. Chloe Zhao for Nomadland. Thoughts on this category? I mean, I I think it's about at least ten years past due for Fincher at this point, but I don't think it's going to be for this. And I enjoyed Mank, and I thought Mank was gorgeously directed. But it is one of the weaker films of his filmography, and I think that's going to hurt him. Um, I promising young woman I adored, but if we're just talking directorial prowess, the look of Nomadland stood out to me more than anything else about that movie, even the performances. There is something about, and it's why I'm very excited. When I for, when I saw Chloe Zhao was going to be directing Marvel's The Eternals, I was like, wow, yeah. that's strange. But you look at the scope of Nomadland. It has this, and I mean this in the best way, a weird look where it's a very intimate story, and yet it's shot in a very epic, with a very epic scope. It feels big and important mm -hmm. when you're watching. A lot of wide shots, a lot of beautiful establishing shots of the, of the rising On location, sun. yeah. All the yeah, location I mean, it's, shots it's, are beautiful. The one thing I praised it for is the, in, in an industry that has so much, you know, kind of, you know, fickleness and 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 uh, fakeness the movie was so authentic i, oh, absolutely. I i'm gonna go with her i, I think she's 
m- maybe the runaway favorite. If there is an upset pick here, I may say Lee Isaac Chung for Minari. Obviously, with Parasite winning it a year ago, you do have to keep an eye on those foreign films and those foreign directors. I mean, we saw well, like- Minari is technically not a foreign film. It is an oh, American- did it not get nom- did it not get nominated for? Oh, well, because it no. got nominated for Best Picture. It got nominated for Best Picture. Yeah. So for no- Minari, um, it's a technicality. So. They use and they. I don't know if you remember this. The category is different this year. the The Oscars changed the category from best foreign language film to best international film. Ah, so okay. now it has to be a production outside of the United States. Okay. Whereas the 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 qualification before was for a film mm, that had to be fit more than fifty percent in another language other than English. I okay. think is what it was before. So now yeah. it's about where it's being produced. Um, so Minari is an American produced film it was shot in the united states um more than 50 percent of it is in uh korean i believe so yeah is it korean or was it mandarin i can't i always i forgot which what language it was in korean yeah it was in korean um there's a lot of english in it uh but the majority of it is in korean um yeah i'm dude i i am a spanish teacher i i was ecstatic when parasite won and i'm also very happy to see thomas vinterberg for another round thomas vinterberg is an incredible director another round um is nominated for best uh international feature as well and i hope it wins best international feature uh another round is absolutely incredible it's now on apple tv plus um, so you have Apple TV plus another round is on there. So you guys got to check that out if you haven't seen it. I'm really excited about this category. We also would be remiss not to mention in the almost 100 years we've had the, the Oscars. This is the first time ever that two women were nominated yeah. for best director in the same year. It's never happened before Two um, two directors of Asian descent in the same year. I don't even know if one had ever been nominated. And now and we have two. I don't think so. No. Um, so very. Uh, groundbreaking in that sense a uh, very um monumental important kind of year you know we had a you have a similar situation with best actor um as well uh or was it best supporting actor well, well best, best actor best actor i know riz ahmed's the first uh muslim to be nominated for first muslim to be nominated yeah. um and i think he's technically they label him of asian descent because his family is from okay. pakistan pakistan um with and then steven young as well or yoon was nominated so pretty cool stuff um i can't think of any snubs um i know spike lee was very angry on twitter that the five bloods did not get nominated for anything other than best score um i enjoyed the five bloods and i thought uh is it delroy lindo well, uh, yeah, should yeah, have been if, nominated for best uh, supporting actor but... I'll, I'll agree with you there and i didn't i did not particularly care for that movie. yeah i, I know don't, you were I a don't fan of it really care for a lot of spike lee's movies but he what he was excellent in that he does very get the good. most out of his actors i i think I was surprised because that's another actor, character actor for a long time. I thought maybe we'd have kind of like a, a J.K. Simmons-esque sort of nomination where you get a guy who's been in a ton of movies and finally gets that perfect role. Yeah, uh, oh, so never I, a lead, always the character actor. Right, so I was surprised he wasn't nominated. Yeah. Um, so one more category here, best picture. I guess before we do best picture, I can really quick mention best animated feature film because I think that's kind of a major category. Um, yeah. I don't know if you want to give your thoughts on this one, but we have Onward, Over the Moon, Shaun the Sheep movie, uh, subtitled Farmageddon, Soul, and Wolf Walkers. Uh, my pick is Wolf Walkers. I don't know if you had a chance to watch it. It's also on Apple TV+. Plus. I have not yet, but it I may have so, to now that I got Apple so TV. Good. But so uh, good. Soul will win. And, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, I would be shocked if, it, if... I would be ecstatic if Wolf Walkers won, but I would be absolutely shocked um so best animated feature let's do best picture now i just thought i would mention that one uh we have for our nominate nominees for best picture 2021 we got the father judas and the black messiah mank minari nomadland promising young woman sound of metal the trial of the chicago seven those are our nominees nominees two four six eight isn't the limit 10 so they didn't do 10 this year two yeah six, eight. they can do 10 they only did eight mm-hmm. i um this is tough because i think nomad land is gonna win a lot of the technical awards i think it'll win director might win actress cinematography best picture is a weird one and we've seen in recent years the film that with the exception of parasite the film that is often kind of the odds on favorite coming into the awards and then they get to best, it wins a bunch of technical categories and they get to best picture and they kind of, you know, swerve in the other direction. Several years ago, yeah. several years ago, Roma cleaned up 
best picture goes to green book uh la la land <laughs> that's right. so stupid yeah. i know and i don't know of oh, anyone who man. agrees with that la la land cleaned up they go to moonlight uh the revenant cleaned up they go to uh uh what well, spotlight which is a great you know, yeah great great movie um yeah so i can't shake the feeling that judas and the black messiah might might be the one that kind of pulls the upset here but i'm mm-hmm. i'm i'm 40 certain of that and i'm about 55 when you say upset are you saying upset over nomad land yeah okay. i still i'm still going nomad land but I think that there may, because I think that between Judas and the Black Messiah and Trial of the Chicago Seven, I think there might be a race for second. And I think Nomad Land edges them out and, and wins Best Picture. Um, and one thing I want to mention here is I, I, there's so many years when when there's a lot of bad movies that get nominated for Best Pic- Picture. I wouldn't. Now the only one I haven't seen is The Father. I've seen the rest. And I wouldn't call any of these bad movies. I no. think they're all good movies. And I've heard so much praise for The Father, so I can only assume that that's, that's a movie I'll probably enjoy. Um, so I'm really happy with this list. Um, I always think it's strange that they don't utilize the full nominations. They, they've done this before where yeah. they're allotted 10 and they don't nominate 10. I don't know what the thinking is behind that or what's going I, on behind the scenes. And I don't, con- I don't know what the science, they always keep that under wraps. Where is the cutoff where a movie goes from, okay, this can be nominated for best picture, but this can't. Yeah. yeah. I, I know it's very strange. And I always hear the rumors that the, the Academy and the, uh, the voters are not necessarily watching all of these films. They're not watching all the films that come out in 2020 in general or the majority of them. So they tend to, you know, and sometimes they'll just, they'll nominate stuff that, you know, it has a big household name. Um, so I, I could see Mank winning, um, but I'm with you. I think Judas and the Black Messiah, I'd be surprised if Judas and the Black Messiah didn't win. Um, those are the two I think it would be between. Yeah. If those one of those two won, I wouldn't be surprised. If the if one of the others won, I'd be kind of surprised, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, I'm with you. I will say lastly, in general, this is the first year in a long time. We've talked about certain snubs, but this is the first year in a long time I haven't had one or two major gripes. Like I don't maybe it's just I, yep, I agree with you. Maybe it's just the year having there's fewer releases, and so you know there's less you know, less kind of fat to potentially trim, you know, to kind of cut, cut it into. But I, I think in general, I was, you know, I was pretty pleased with the nominations. I, uh, for best picture, I would have nominated one night in Miami. I thought that was excellent. Um, yeah. I, I, a lot of people that's again, that you got 10, not, you can do 10 nominations. Yeah, you might as well they just throw it, it in there. I, I've yeah. heard a lot of, I haven't had a chance to watch yet, but I've heard a lot of good things about it. And it qualified, even though it was released mm-hmm. in 2021, it was in the qualifying window. So I'm surprised that one didn't get nominated with all yeah, the praise so. and it got nominated for other Oscars. So, yeah. Um, again, like you said, I don't know what goes on behind the scenes and people, spe- right. people speculate and, you know, some of the details have come out, but the only other thing before we leave, uh, our Oscars discussion here, unless, um, Chris has any other parting thoughts is I just want to really quickly shout out three of the films that got best documentary feature nominations, because I think you should watch all of these. Anyone listening, if you have not, um, five were nominated, the three, the only three that I've seen of the five that are all great. Crip camp is on Netflix must watch. The Mole Agent is a Chilean documentary, so I was really happy to see another foreign film get nominated under another category. It's on Hulu. Really damn good documentary. Time is on Amazon Prime. Um, so all three of those are very good documentaries. They all got nominated. Collective, um, I have heard good things. Haven't watched it yet. My Octopus Teacher, I have heard nothing about. Hmm. Not familiar with it. So, But those other three, got to check out. Um, any parting thoughts, Chris, on the 93rd? academy Uh, awards uh, to be honest no like i said in general my parting thoughts were probably what i said a few minutes ago which is that i'm I'm in general pretty happy with the nominees well all right with that and i i'm right there with you man i like i said i'm pretty happy with a lot of these nominations and like i i mentioned earlier i'm pleasantly surprised to see i mean i i feel like i shouldn't be because there were so few films um, in terms of popular movies, well-known films, there's a lot mm-hmm. of films that came out. You just had to look this year at what you couldn't just go to a, th- a theater most of the year and just, hey, what's on the queue? What's playing right now, right? What do I go watch? Most of that stuff got pushed. You had to go to streaming services. You had to deep dive through Prime, Hulu, Apple TV. You know, you had to deep dive to find stuff that came out or go online and read. So stuff came out, but I was happy to see some of these smaller films like Sound of Metal, Minari, No Man Land, Promising Young Woman, films that in a normal year, 
probably wouldn't have gotten as much love because so much stuff um, overshadows it. Yeah. Um, so those are my parting thoughts. So without further ado, the last thing we're going to talk about before we wrap things up and get back to watching March Madness uh, is we're going to talk about the latest Russo Brothers film, Cherry. Um, Chris did do a review of this on his channel. I will link his review down below. Um, if you are not aware, Cherry is now showing it's in theaters. It's showing on Apple TV plus, um, it is a new film from Anthony and Joe Russo who are well known in the Marvel cinematic universe. Uh, it is an American crime drama film. And then that's a very broad category to put it yeah. in. We'll kind of get into why that's, that's a very broad way to categorize it. Uh, that's the way it's categorized on Wikipedia and, um, online uh, the film stars Tom Holland in the lead role and it's based on a novel uh, from a veteran named Nico Walker and he wrote the novel in prison when he was encouraged to do so because his his life his his exploits and kind of some of the things he went through are pretty interesting uh, the Russo brothers upon him being released from prison bought the rights for a million dollars for this novel um, this film is getting a lot of hate. Chris yeah. acknowledged it in his review. Um, I actually, I, I have to mention before we start talking about, I was not going to watch this film. Um, I watched, we, we talked in our episode in my episode four that we did on this podcast. Uh, Chris and I talked about Chris Stuckman a little bit. I watched his review and I was like, okay, he's kind of middle of the road on it. And then I saw your review and you, and, and I trust your opinion. You gave it a pretty positive review, or at least you, like you mentioned, you just fell on the line of a recommendation. So yeah. I was like, okay, I'll check it out. So I did watch it yesterday. Um, I don't, I, I, I get the hate and I don't. I get people not liking it. I understand not liking it because we're going we're gonna to get into it. It has a lot of problems. Yeah. There's a lot of things to be critical about with this film, but there's a lot of things that I, I liked. I don't know. I sat there and more than once out loud to myself, I'm like, I kind of like this. I don't know. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, enjoy, I'm, I'm not like upset that I'm watching this or not enjoying my time watching this film. So um that's my introduction to it. I'll kind of let you give some of your opening thoughts here on this. Well, the, the thing that kept, you know, the point that kept sticking out in my head, and I mentioned this in my review, it is memorable. Like, I, I'm not oh, going to yeah. forget what it is. There are so many things about it that are so bizarre and even at <laughs> points coming across as somewhat experimental. I mean, in terms of just the style of it, uh, that it, it does it does stick out. I understand the contempt to a certain extent because it is in many ways an obnoxious film with its style. I, yes, I mean, it's very over the top. Yeah, it's and kind of like yeah. full of itself. And yeah, I it's it's not as bad but it's kind of like if Michael Bay directed Requiem for a Dream. Like it, it's where where you take or a Or Full story. Metal Jacket. Right, yeah, yeah, it's or, like or in some, that vein. Some, yeah, some hodgepodge that. of the two where it's yeah. it, it's it's style over substance. Absolutely. But there was enough stu- substance for me to be like, all right, I'm this a recommendation, mainly because of the fact that I, you know, I think Tom Holland's excellent. You know, I don't agree. The Russo brothers, it seemed like we're trying to do like a late Oscar push with it. I don't think he's that great, but I think in general. Um, I think he was better in the devil all the time. Yeah. I thought he was great in that too, but I think it's a fearless performance. It's, it's a film that could have used, I think, one more draft of the script. Because the one thing that stood out to me, too, is that I thought it's weird because the Russos, who are so good with the action in the Captain America movies and yep. in, in the, the Avengers movies, I thought the army stuff was pretty flat. Um, but they, they kept they, using a lot of, they even not even just those scenes, but a lot of scenes in the movie, they kept using a lot of, I don't know if it was a drone or a helicopter shot, but a lot of above overhead shots Mm -hmm. and a lot of wide sweeping shots, um, especially for those sequences. I didn't understand, and I'll have to, maybe I'll have to do some more research. I I didn't understand changing the aspect ratio when he went went to, you know, went to war. I, I don't, uh, I, I'd have to look up more in, as to what the intent was. And there were those moments yeah. throughout the film where I'm like, I don't know what you're going for here, but they have said in multiple interviews, they wanted to make a movie about the opioid crisis. And the best parts of the film are that are Tom Holland and Sierra Bravo struggling with that. And I, it got to the end and obviously you have to stay faithful to the source material, but I kind of felt like it's despite the fact the very end was a bit schmaltzy. 
I was like, okay, this works for me. This works more than it doesn't. I, I get yeah, this. That's how I felt. Uh, it, as disjointed and as fuzzy as it may have been, I think it's hard is in the right place. And it, it the performance has carried it enough where I'll, you know, I, I could even see myself watching it again at some point. If it comes I, on TV. And that's what I was doing. So one of the biggest merits for me um, of a great film is the rewatchability. I always tell people that, and typically, you know, the reviews that I've pushed on Instagram for years. And, you know, when I've done some of this stuff on YouTube, that's usually my biggest talking point, especially near the end of my thoughts on a film or even a TV show, a miniseries, anything. Does it have rewatchability? Is this going to hold up on a second viewing? Is this something I would want to watch again? Um, even more than twice, you know, multiple times. And I couldn't help thinking all day today, I was split on that. Because on the one hand, it is very memorable. There's a lot of things about it that it, they take a throw shit at the wall and see what sticks approach. Because I feel like every, th there's really four distinct films in this film. And within those four yeah. distinct portions or parts, there's so much going on in terms of the, like you mentioned, the experimentation, uh, the direction, um, you know, the way they use the camera, the way that they're editing in their post-production. Um, they use uh, visual dialogue that's superimposed on the screen during the, uh, the, the, some of the basic training sequences. Um, so, but I couldn't help but thinking there is a lot in that regard that is so interesting that I kept thinking about it today. Mm -hmm. But I was also like, I don't know if I could do two and a half hours of this again. Yeah, I forgot and about I, how long it was. Yeah, it, it dragged. The third act drags. I know you said the opioid um, exploration, that sequence and, you know, the drug abuse, the descent into, you know, uh, you know, the addiction is kind of one of the more interesting aspects of the film. I didn't like that sequence because I didn't think they explored it in an interesting way. I thought sure. it was, I thought they tried to explore it in an interesting way, but like there was nothing said about the, the addiction to me. I don't, I didn't feel like they came across and I felt like it was almost not glorified, but the way that they stylized the film throughout. And even in those sequences, I felt like it was very like, uh, is this how you want to, like you mentioned Requiem for a Dream. It feel, feel, felt like almost a parody of that, like a kind yeah. of a sillier comedic version of that. I, I mean, this film, I mentioned already has four different, I mean, it feels like it's being a coming of age film. Then you have like full metal jacket, like the basic training you mentioned in your review, then it gets kind of like jarhead esque when they finally get into the desert of Iraq and get into war sequences. Then you have, mm -hmm. um, we come back and you have like a requiem for a dream, like, um, or I don't know, list any <laughs> movie where they they detail drug abuse and the problems that come with substance abuse and, and then, then it becomes the place beyond the pines yeah then it becomes a crime bank robbing movie right. or hell, hell or high water something like that right. I mean, they're robbing banks because you know f the banks and we're gonna take money from the banks but we're also gonna fuel our drug addiction right um and, and yeah all of that stuff can make a very interesting film and i think you could have all that stuff in a film but they do so many different things from a directorial standpoint and editing standpoint, you know, the post-production, um, the tone, you mentioned it in your review, the tone is so all over the place. I yeah. don't know. And I'm all for blending tones. And I think there's a lot of directors, a lot of films that do a great job of bringing multiple genres, different tones into a film and blending them. This film doesn't really blend them. It's like, it wants to have its cake and eat it too. It wants to focus on one thing and then go to something completely different. It doesn't really mesh them from, you know, the film is literally broken up into chapters. I mean, they superimpose mm -hmm. chapters from chapter to chapter. I don't feel like these different ideas mesh, but like you said, it's wildly entertaining and memorable. And um, while I don't think by the end, it, it really said anything that interesting on veterans, PTSD, substance mm -hmm. abuse, crime in America, especially when it comes to, you know, veterans who are, you know, downtrodden and not treated well. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know about you, but I don't think it ever took time to really say anything interesting. I think it was more, the film was more, and the Russo brothers were more concerned with the style and being so wildly entertaining and experimental that along the way, they kind of left 
left behind some of those interesting themes that could have been explored in a meaningful way. And they end up exploring them in kind of the most run of the mill way, you know, some of the, some of the most cliche ways, I mean, that you could have possibly done it that just like you, I think, I think you said in your review, or maybe I'm thinking of Chris Stuckman, I can't remember whose review I was watching, uh, where they, they talk about how from scene to scene and chapter to chapter, you can literally, they're wearing their influences on their sleeve. I mean, you can Mm -hmm. say, this is full metal jacket. You know, this is like you said, uh, place beyond the pines. This is, uh, you know, name any movie that those, those genres fall under, but Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't disagree with anything you said. I don't, it's just, I, and I think the Russos are, it's like, this would have been a great movie to make like next time around. Like, I think they should have had one more movie in between the big popcorn fun. That was the Avengers movies. It's like, I don't know if they are yet. And I well, think they, get- they did. They did. Uh, Extraction. Extraction was on Netflix last year. Wasn't oh that Russo God, Brothers? I forgot about that. Yeah, did they, 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 they directed slipped, that? Yeah, they slipped oh, that in goodness. between. I think uh, they I, wrote it too, I think. Wow. Yeah, I guess you're right. I just, I think, I think they'll get there. But right now, I don't know if uh, they're, you really need a layer of, of maturity and depth to be able to tackle uh, you know, stuff like that. Stuff like they, addiction. Sorry, because, I don't mean to interrupt you. They wrote oh, in. They wrote and produced it. They did not direct it. They were the writers okay. and the producers. So, okay. Well, so that yeah. kind of explains that the direction of that film was was a little bit more cohesive and and fluid and uh, mm. you know wasn't all over the place like this one. So sorry. Yeah, no, I mean it's 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 everywhere. It's tonally inconsistent. Um, it is, yeah. I mean, like you said, it is a little bit hollow. But there's there's not a, there's not much emotional resonance to, no. uh, at the end regarding. I those didn't characters. feel for any of them. I I felt like they held you at they end up making you feel like you're held at arm's length throughout the film Mm -hmm. because even though you want to feel sorry for, I I know they don't say Nico Walker. I know it's based on his life, but they never, they just call him cherry. He's referred to as cherry. I don't even think he's ever named, um, you know, distinctly named in the film, but um, I know you, you want to feel sorry for him and guys like him who were manipulated into the, in the military because they had nothing else to do. They were preyed upon in that regard. Then they're suffering from PTSD when they come back, they're not treated well when they get back, but the way the film explores it, and again, Tom Holland, like you said, gives a great performance. Great. I, yeah. the, the, one of the best scenes in the movie, I think, is when right after the first battle that he is in and stuffs the guy's guts back into him and sees all these people dying. Um, and, or no, 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 excuse me. It's after he sees his, his roommate, his bunk mate burned alive. Um, when he calls his wife on the phone and he is telling her to talk about her and he's doing everything he can to hold back crying. That to me was one of the most emotionally you know, that one resonated with me, that scene, I thought he did a great job with that. That was probably more so from him. Um, And just maybe it's a little manipulative and cheap because you show that in a film, you show a character, you know, who's seen something like that. um, You're naturally going to feel sorry for him. But I think Tom Holland delivers. I think he delivers in that moment. Outside of that scene, there's not many that stick with me where I really felt for the characters because they're so unlikable in the second half. Mm -hmm. I think they could have explored them a little bit differently or portrayed them a little bit differently for you to feel a little bit more sorry for them. I mean, the place beyond the pines and hell or high water are great, you know, bank robbing movies that I feel for those characters. Yeah. they explore them and develop them throughout the film and you empathize with them, even though they're criminals. I didn't feel that in the second half and the later, because they're just feeling a drug addiction. um, And you show them just being pieces of shit. Yeah. (laughs) During and the really substance out, abuse, I mean, and really outside of the the relationship between the two main characters, there's not a whole lot of depth as to what got them to that point. It was they met, yeah. they got addicted to drugs, and that's it. There's no real, there's no real pathos. There's no real, real backstory regarding how they got to that point. Uh, and yeah, like I said, I mean, it is there's there's a hollowness to it, but there's just it outside of this that small part in the middle where it dragged. And it does it does run long. Uh, it, it rarely bored me and like all yeah. those flaws or stuff like when I was watching it, I enjoyed it. And there is something to be said for that, which is why I'd still give it just the most mild of recommendations. Yep. I'm right there with you. And I, and it's, I'm glad you mentioned, you know, the pathos, the journey, the, the character arcs, the development, because um, that was something else to me as I sat and I thought about this film, I watched some reviews, read some reviews and kind of went back over my own thoughts on it. And it is strange what they choose to explore in the film 
opposed to what they don't choose to explore. Like, um, especially with the substance abuse, like they show us sh- shitting her pants because she can't get yeah. her high again. Um, why, why, why do we need to see that? Right. They, they, they spend moments with the characters when they're like, you know, in bed and they're just high. And, and even early in the film, um, some of the ways the characters are introduced and set up, like you said, I, I didn't feel like they explored the right aspects of the characters if that makes sense in order for yeah. me to care about them and engage with them right. um and then what happens over the course of the film just really further removed me from having any investment in them um but yeah like you said i mean from start to finish i mean there's no shortage of entertainment um and you know what the hell moments like i, I comment i commented on your review the uh uh, colon cam the colon cam yeah. oh my i that was all over twitter before i even watched the movie so like i was like that's in this movie and it's very brief oh it's but, it's two seconds yeah but it's so brief that as soon as it's over you're like wait yeah, a minute. you have you have to do what? a double take because it's 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 one of those <laughs> you don't know what it is right away and then you just wait okay and then but it's it's one of those examples where the movie has has so many random tricks that it throws at you that by the time you're able to process them, you've moved on to another one. So yeah, it's, like, yeah, it's like you're like, wait, did they really just do that? And then you're yeah. on to something else. Like, I, I don't know if that's what they were trying to do or if they were genuinely thinking that they were making interesting artistic visual choices. That's another thing. I would like to watch some interviews with I, yeah, the Russo I'd have brothers. To, I'd have to watch interviews. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I I can't tell. I can't tell. Some of that stuff is just it's so bizarre i mean yeah. i i don't know and i again that's kind of it kind of fuels the entertainment factor and kind of yeah. gives it a reason to recommend it mm-hmm. um somewhat um but yeah I, I don't know um that's that's about all of my thoughts on it. i guess the only other thing that i would mention is i i did want to kind of we, we we talked about most of it but if you're listening i'm hoping you've you know you've don't care that you're being spoiled. I, I usually preface my, our reviews with a spoiler warning, but um, if you're listening at this point, you've already had spoiled for you. Um, some other things they do in this, I mean, there's no shortage of weird artistic choices that singled out, or maybe if they kept it consistent throughout the film would be interesting, but it's also entertaining and stupid at the same time, because they throw so many different things at you. I mean, right. between, between the narration which is completely like ripped off of Forrest Gump. I mean, even the film itself kind of feels like a, uh, I think it was Chris Stuckman mentioned like a parody of, of Forrest Gump. Yeah. So, yeah. But then within the narration, there's multiple scenes where they break the fourth wall. They literally divide the film up in chapters. Like it was like they wanted the film to visually appear like you're living in a novel, like you're being a part of the novel, which I'm not against. I love when Quentin Tarantino does it, but then they, the way they start it, they have a prologue in 2007. Do they not know what a prologue is? Like, I know a prologue leads into your story, but generally it happens before what happens in the story. And then the movie goes, point, man, the movie goes back to 2002 and chapter one. I it's weird. I don't, I, I don't know. And then they do these tongue in cheek visuals. Like I heard someone compare it to fight club. Like, did you yeah. notice the, the name tags oh. on the soldiers and the doctors, Dr. Whomever Sergeant, whomever, and then shitty bank, like in the background, the names yeah. of the bank was like F U bank or shitty. It was like, it was like something out of fight club where they have these mm-hmm. tongue in cheek um, visuals that if you're not looking for them, you're not going to see them. So mm-hmm. it was like, they tried so many different things. And again, it's entertaining, but it's like, it's a mess. Yeah, it's so messy. Yeah, it I feels so disjointed. That, <laughs> yeah. Can't deny that. Anyway, um, I think that's about all, all the notes, all the things I'd written down, mm-hmm. written down that I wanted to discuss. Did you have? Uh, I know you already did a review. Again, if you want to listen to Christopher's review, the link will be in the uh, yep. description box. On uh, if you're watching on YouTube, um, any other parting thoughts? Uh, like you, I would give it a slight recommend, but it is kind of a, at your own risk. I mean, it's long. It's weird. It's mm-hmm. stupid. It's obnoxious. It's entertaining. It's a little bit of everything. If somebody, my last thought will be, if somebody came to me and said, that was the biggest piece of shit I've ever seen. Why did you recommend that? I'd say, <laughs> I'd nod my head and go, yeah. And if somebody came to me and said, that was, that was spectacular. I've never seen anything like it. It was crazy. It was all over the place. I loved it. I'd go, yeah, okay. It makes sense. <laughs> it's, it's, it's going to be one of those polarizing films that I think people, uh, uh, will that people will discuss when you know years from now when we talk about the Russo brothers' filmography? 
Yeah, I I'm right there with you. I'm gonna be. I just am gonna be so curious to see what they do next. Um, mm-hmm. I don't have their IMDb pulled up, but on Wikipedia they don't have a current project set up. Um, so I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Like I said, they after and after they finished their Avengers films, they did Extraction last year. If you've seen Extraction, it's solid. It's got some good action sequences. They wrote and produced that. But this is their first direct. Oh, they do have a film. It's to be announced though. It does not have a date. They oh, yeah. are set up to do the Gray Man. Yeah, which has a re- remarkable cast. I know. Mm. Um, Based on a book, the Gray yeah. Man. Name my guess book. is uh, mm. gonna be on the, Netflix. The, my guess is they'll do one more movie, and if it stinks or if it bombs, you're gonna be hearing about Avengers Five, directed by the Russo brothers, coming soon. I mean, that if if I, I feel the way with the, those actors too. If things go wrong, they are they will be welcome back to Marvel with open arms. You. You got it. Before we wrap this up, you got to hear this though. This is unbelievable. I don't know if you've looked, taken a look at this. I, I guess I remember people saying some things on Twitter about this. It's got Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans in it. Yeah. Ana de Armas, who was, you know, great in Knives right, Out. Yeah. Um, some Billy Bob Thornton. Um, some of the other names I don't recognize just reading them, but it is set to be the most expensive film ever produced by Netflix. $200 million. What's, do you know what's first? Uh, I would imagine the Irishman had to have been more, or had yeah, to have been that's up right. There. That was about one hundred and fifty or one hundred and seventy-five. So, I can't yeah, believe I mean, this. That is amazing. <laughs> you know, I, I get it, but what if you're, is this? The yeah. Gray Man. The book's not even that old. It came out in two thousand nine. Debut novel about a freelance assassin and former CIA operative. That's huh. a cool premise. Sounds yeah. interesting. So yeah. we'll see. We'll I'll see what down. the Russo brothers do next here with the Gray Man. But yep. All right. Um, we got to get back to some March Madness here. I got to let Chris go so we can uh, enjoy ourselves here watching some basketball. Thanks, Chris, man. I know you were on episode four, but you are more than welcome to plug plug away, man, before we wrap yeah. up. At Castellani2014 on Twitter. There you'll find the link to my YouTube page where, as Vince said, I'm reviewing movies. And I have another show, Locked on Tigers. It's at Locked on Tigers on Twitter for the Locked on Podcasting network it's uh it's been really fun the last couple weeks i've gotten a few more guests in we're doing crossover shows and the season is rapidly approaching talking tigers baseball and i also work for mazenbrew.com doing two podcasts for them for them the brewcast and the untitled michigan hoops pod which we've been doing all year and hopefully we'll be able to do several more as the team hopefully makes a run knock on wood makes a deep run through march and hopefully (laughs) to the final four we'll see what happens so please follow me on uh, all those platforms subscribe like do all that fun stuff and i i appreciate you having me on again man this is a lot of fun absolutely man and for all those links they will be if you're on youtube again i'll have them in the description of the video um otherwise chris thanks for joining me man uh we'll be back again with another guest very soon um until next time i'm vince the film nerd podcast and uh go watch some movies 